America. And Arthur Kussler sums it up in his book, The Thirteenth Tribe, uh, when he says this, talking of this situation about the origins out of Khazaria. It would mean that their ancestors come not from the Jordan, but from the Volga. Not from Canaan, but from the Caucasus, once believed to be the cradle of the Aryan race. That's what we get the term Caucasian from, we use for white people in America. And that genetically, Kostler says, they are more closely connected to the Hun, Uyghur, and Magar tribes than to the seed of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Should this turn out to be the case, he says, and it does, and you've got to look at other people's research like Shlomo Sand, etc. Should this turn out to be the case, then the term anti-Semitism would be void of meaning, based on a misapprehension uh, shared by both the killers and their victims. The story of the Khazar Empire, as it slowly emerges from the past, begins to look like the most cruel hoax which history has ever perpetrated. And on that cruel hoax has come all that has followed. We're going to go into the implications of that today because it's, it's got massive implications for what's happening as, um, as I speak. And that uh, mention there of anti-Semitism is another one of those inversion. Because the Khazars were not Semitic people. The term Semitic doesn't refer to a race. It refers to a language group. And that language group overwhelmingly consists of peoples and nations, wait for it, that today we now call Arab. So the Semitic race is are the Arab races. And yet, to challenge the horrific um, actions of Israel, or to challenge the manipulations of the House of Rothschild and Henry Kissinger and all these people, you get called anti-Semitic, which again is a <laughs> laughable inversion of the truth and the way things really are. So let's, um, let's work our way through the, um, the story. Shlomo Sand not only wrote a book about the invention of the Jewish people, he wrote one more recently, 2013, um, about the invention of the land of Israel. And uh, he uh, questions whether there ever was this Jewish, ancient Jewish nation at all. And when you think about it, it's all based on ancient texts, biblical texts, um, written by who knows who, who knows when, in who knows what circumstances, and based on the fact that, that some god, some angry, vicious, bloodthirsty god of the Old Testament decided to award to Abraham and, and all his successors and, and, and what have you, the land of Israel. Now, even if you follow the biblical texts, then it wasn't a land that was theirs from the start. They colonized it. You know, the, the whole story of Moses and going into the, the, the promised land. They colonized it with God, you know, on the sidelines, cheering them on, saying, kill them all, slaughter them. I don't care who it is, men, women, children, anything, kill them. And, of course, that mentality still prevails when you look at current uh, events. And the story of the Khazar origins of today's Jewish people. And those that haven't you know, read my books or read these books will be um, very surprised at this, I'm sure. But for a long, long time, that was a legitimate or considered a legitimate part of 
Jewish historical research. And then suddenly, the lid was put on it, and it was suppressed so that um, it became uh, ridiculed, you were attacked if you uh, went there, and there was a systematic effort to um, wipe the truth of today's Jewish origins uh, in Khazaria out of um, mainstream uh, history. In fact, um, let me read you a little uh, quote here from Shlomo Sand's uh, book, The Invention of the Jewish People. He says here, from 1951 to the present moment, not a single historical work about the Khazars has appeared in Hebrew. Nor was Pollock's Khazaria ever reissued. It served till the end of the 1950s as a legitimate point of departure for Israeli researchers, but it lost its status over the years systematically, for reasons I'll come to. Except for one modest MA thesis on this subject and one published routine seminar paper, there has been nothing. The Israeli academic world has been mute on this topic. Uh, no significant research has taken place. Slowly and consistently, any mention of the Khazars in the public arena in Israel, um, or any, anywhere else mostly, uh, came to be tagged as eccentric, freakish, and even menacing. And that is the classic way they discredit truth and discredit those that communicate uh, truth. So what was behind this suppression of the true history of Jewish people? Well, it was the house of Rothschild overwhelmingly, and their creation, Zionism, or Rothschild Zionism, as I call it, to constantly emphasize and underpin the true creators and controllers of what we call Zionism today. Because Rothschild Zionism has worked to make itself an interchangeable term with Jewish people. So if you challenge Zionism, you're anti-Semitic. Well, you're not, for reasons I've explained, but you're anti-Jewish. When um, large numbers of Jewish people um, oppose Zionism, some of them vehemently. And the manipulation of information uh, led the Zionist conspiracy to A, produce a fake history or emphasize a fake history of Jewish people today and to suppress the true history. And Zionism is not about race. It's not about race. It's a political, in its play out in the public arena um, expression. It is merely a political movement that supports a homeland for Jewish people in Israel. But at its core, this is the point, at its core, its inner core, its Rothschild core, it is a secret society. A secret society that locks into the rest of the web um, and moves as one unit towards this global tyranny I'm exposing. And so when you see um, 2%, less than 2% of American people um, are Jewish. Significantly less than that number will actually be Zionists and supporters of Zionism. And a heck of a lot less than that number will be attached to the secret society level of Rothschild Zionism. And yet, if you look at look in my books, the ratio of Rothschild Zionists to positions of significant power in the United States over a long period of time, not least around surrounding uh, before, during, and after 9/11, um, 
is absolutely fantastic. These people at that level are not representatives of Jewish people. They, they have contempt for Jewish people in general. They are agents of the secret society with its um, uh, global agenda. Now, Zionism began in um, the late 1800s, the late 19th century, uh, with the first Zionist conference in Baal, Switzerland, um, chaired by Theodore Herzl, the founder of the Zionist movement, although, you know, he's a, he was a, um, just a front man, a yes man, a gopher for the uh, uh, Rothschilds. Now, it was in Baal, Switzerland. But what they don't tell you, but I'll tell you, it was supposed to be originally held, that first Zionist conference, in um, Munich, Germany. But that could not happen because of the vehement opposition of Jews in Germany to the idea that they were going to be shipped out and moved to Israel, which is what Zionism wanted. And so when events moved forward, and we had the horrors of Nazi Germany, which I say the Rothschilds were fundamentally behind, by the way. Suddenly, people were moving out of Germany, for obvious reasons, to Israel and um, to the United States. So let's take the story forward. You had Zionism, modern Zionism, created in the late 19th century. And a few years later came the First World War. And um, we had Germany um, going walkabout. And the other nations of Europe uh, responding to that. And we had this World War. And uh, the Americans were brought in uh, eventually. And the Americans... Um, came in because of uh, deals done in the background which involved something called the Balfour Declaration. In other words, the Americans will come in with the Rothschilds manipulating in the background, but for that to happen, we want this. And what it was, was a declaration by the British Foreign Secretary called um, Arthur Balfour. And when you hear something like the Balfour Declaration, you would think that he would stand up in the Houses of Parliament or make a speech somewhere and make this declaration. It actually wasn't. It was a letter. And it was a letter sent um, by Lord Balfour, the Foreign Secretary, to Baron Rothschild, Walter Rothschild, second Baron Rothschild. They love their bloody titles in school. Um, and this is what it said. His Majesty's government view with favour the establishment in Palestine of a national home for the Jewish people and will use their best endeavours to facilitate the achievement of this project. This is part of that deal I was talking about. Um, it being clearly understood that nothing shall be done. This is, this is a sick joke now that nothing shall be done which may prejudice the civil and religious rights of existing non-Jewish communities in Palestine or the rights and the political status enjoyed by Jews in any other um, country. So there you have, um, on November the 2nd, 1917, the Balfour Declaration, which given the, the power of Britain, the empire and all that stuff in those days, was, was a massive step forward towards bringing about the Jewish homeland. So, clearly, when you are justifying this on an historical um, fake, i.e. it's the ancient land of today's Jewish people, you have got to suppress the truth about the origins of um, Kazaria. And so more and more that was suppressed as, as Slomer Sanders um, explained. Then after the First World War, all that horror, all that death, all that slaughter, 
came to the Versailles Peace Conference in 1919. And as I explaining my books, the major representatives of each country um, and advisors um, for each of the major players, Britain, uh, United States, France, etc., at the Versailles Peace Conference, were Rothschild frontmen, um, big time. And they declared their support for a homeland in Israel. We're now moving along here. But there were uh, still... Uh, problems um, and hurdles to be overcome, not least of which uh, so many Jewish people in Germany wanted nothing to do with it. They were fine, thank you, don't need that. And for Israel to be established, it needed lots of um, Jewish people to justify its existence. So along came World War II with the rise of the Nazis and Adolf Hitler. And there's no question Uh, It's documentable uh, documentable fact that the Nazis were funded by um, Rothschild-connected families like the Rockefellers in America. I mean, the Rockefellers um, were were funding um, Hitler's race purity movement. They they funded a whole floor of a university to allow the the Hitler's race purity expert, uh, Ernst Rudin, to to do his work. So the Nazis in Germany were created... Um, not just within Germany, but externally through the um, Rothschild networks and the Rockefellers and people like this. All documentable facts, you know, with the the Rockefellers, etc. And so he then turns on Jewish people and starts, again, going walkabout, as in the First World War, and other countries responded, and we had World War II. We also had uh, the concentration camps and the horrific... um, treatment of Jew- Jewish people in Germany and, and other people too like communists and, and uh, disabled people other people that the Nazis didn't like and then as a result of that horrific treatment in Germany and you know I said earlier they couldn't give a damn this this inner um, secret society level of Rothschild Zionism couldn't give a damn about Jewish people in general. They're just pawns in their game like everyone else's. And because that, that horrific treatment led to a, a, an outpouring of um, kind of horror. And from that came the pressure to allow the homeland in Israel based on this historical lie. And so the movement began and there was a whole nation of people there at the time, Palestinians. And it turns my stomach when I see Israeli politicians and leaders condemning terrorism and we only want peace. Israel has never wanted peace at the level of the the regime because um, it's always done the opposite. And when uh, the the Jewish people started arriving in numbers because Jewish people had lived in Palestine for a long time and, and they, they got fantastic with um, the, the Palestinian people. And in fact, the, the, some of the most uh, vehement opposers of this mass influx of Jewish people out of Germany um, and elsewhere were Jewish people already lived there because they, they, their lifestyle and, and, and the, um, their way of life and their interaction with the Palestinians all also went up in smoke, literally, often. And the Jewish leadership that established itself in Germany, and all of them answerable to, uh, in Israel, all of, all of them answerable to uh, the Rothschilds, then created um, terrorist groups like Ergun and the Stern Gang, um, and they started uh, doing horrific terrorist acts to terrify the Palestinian population. And in the end, their grotesque actions led to something like 800,000 Palestinian people leaving their homeland in terror at the terrorism of the Jewish regime that was establishing itself in, in Israel. And you had people like who became prime ministers, like um, Menachem Begin, Yitzhak, Shamir and others, they were 
operatives in these terrorist groups who then went on to be prime minister and condemn the terrorism uh, of others. Extraordinary hypocrisy. So what we then had um, was the establishment of, of Israel in, in part of Palestine. But that was never how it was meant uh, to end. It was going to be a, a, a process of constant acquisition until they had the bloody lot and, and indeed created this greater um, uh, Israel, which um, it, it is claimed the, um, that God, the Old Testament God again, gave to Abraham from the river in Egypt, the Nile, across to the Euphrates in uh, what is now Iraq, and, and that includes parts of Syria, obviously parts of Iraq, um, and uh, Jordan and, and other countries, and we're seeing that unfolding, this, this progressive, uh, progressive um, acquisition. So one of the, the means that's been used has been to entice or manipulate attempted invasions of Israel, because thanks to the United States, and not least Britain as well, they have vast um, superiority in weaponry, in the military. And so when there have been invasions, the, or attempted invasions, the, the great um, superiority of the Israeli military has pushed it all back, back into those countries, and then they've, they've kept it. And so we had the, um, the realigning of what constituted um, Israel at the time of the 1967 um, war and then others. And then we've had the, again, progressive takeover of uh, lands which uh, the Israeli regime is occupying against um, international law, where well, they can do whatever they really like, um, because the Rothschilds control Israel, and the Rothschilds control America, and the Rothschilds control Britain, and the Rothschilds control the UN. So, you know, uh, anything goes. Um, what would be roundly condemned in any other country, um, uh, like, like Iran, is just excused when Israel did. They're just defending themselves by, yeah, by slaughtering civilians. Yeah. Okay. So progressively, the so-called settlements have taken more and more and more and more land. And when you see now um, what is left of Palestinian land, it is pathetic compared with what the situation was in um, even 1948 when the State of Israel was established. And so what we're seeing in current times is the continuation of this progression. And if people are going to be streetwise to see what's going on, they have to loosen their, their focus and their obsession with sides, with black and white sides. That's not how it works. If you want to control a football match, in other words, you want to control a situation. If you control one side, you're not going to control the football match or the situation. You're going to, you're going to influence it, yes, but you're not going to control it. Because there's another side you don't influence or control. And so the game is to control and manipulate through the other side as well. And through, you know, the UN and the United States also control the referee of the game and bring about the circumstances you want. So just because you've got a group like ISIS that's been taking over large chunks of um, Iraq and is, is fighting the Syrian regime of Assad, all of which is absolutely in line with um, Israel's long-term goals of acquiring all that land. Um, just because they call themselves um, Muslim fanatics doesn't mean that at the core they might be controlled by something else. They are. And they're controlled from the United States. And if they're controlled from the United States, they're controlled from, from Israel. Um, and that doesn't mean that every one of these lunatics with their, with their, with their guns and their black flags um, is uh, in on the game. Most of them are not. They don't have to be. 
you get a fanatic who, who hasn't got two brain cells to rub together and, and you wind them up and you tell them it's about jihad and it's about, you know, fighting for, for Allah and God and all that bloody nonsense. And they'll go and do your bidding, believing that's why they're doing it. But at the core, they're not you know, doing it for that reason um, at all. And it's always been interesting to me when I have watched circumstances progress in uh, the Middle East and, and, and Israel, many times now, to the point where um, you know that it's building up to Israel doing another invasion or attack job on Gaza, because they just want to destroy that place. I mean, that, that, that's an open-air prison camp, open-air concentration camp, basically. But when you see the progression of events and you think, there you go, Israel wants to um, have another go at Gaza, every time, every time, rockets, pop gun rockets compared with what Israel has, yes, but rockets start getting fired out of Gaza, at Egypt, uh, sorry, at, at Israel. And that gives um, the Israeli regime the opportunity every time to justify going in and blowing the shit out of the um, civilian population. And I was, um, I was looking through um, a book of mine called Remember Who You Are um, the other day. And a certain passage that I, I wrote in it, it's um, two, two years or so, two, three years or so since this book came out. And given current events, it's quite uh, prophetic when you see um, some of the information here that I'll read to you now. Remember, this was, this was years ago, but this is the pattern that is now being repeated in current times. Because if you want to control the game, you've got to control both sides. Or well, however many sides there are in it. Okay, uh, the book says this. One of the main ways that the Israelis stall on any agreement, uh, the peace agreement, I'm talking about, with, with the Palestinians, is by saying they can't negotiate with the elected Palestinian government, because it is a terrorist organization known as Hamas. And they're now saying Hamas is behind all these rockets. We must stop Hamas. Hey. So it goes on. Well, how funny. Israel created Hamas as a bogeyman that could give them the excuse not to negotiate and so have more time to finish the job of Palestinian genocide. The other bogeyman at that time, um, re-emerging in the Middle East to frighten people, is called the Muslim Brotherhood, um, which was involved in the People's Revolution, the original one, in uh, Egypt. The Muslim Brotherhood has an interesting background too. Britain and America established um, the Muslim Brotherhood after the collapse of the Ottoman Empire in 1924. And they are still controlled by the same crowd to this day, although the Brotherhood has also served the interests of the Nazis, Israelis, Russians, French and Germans over the years. Israel is now among the major sponsors of the Muslim Brotherhood, which was involved in the founding of Hamas. Robert Dreyfus, the author of Devil's Game, How the United States Helped Unleash Fundamentalist Islam, wrote... Beginning in 1967 and through to the late 1980s, Israel helped the Muslim Brotherhood establish itself in the occupied territories. Um, it assisted Ahmed Yassin, the leader of the Brotherhood, in creating Hamas, betting that its Islamist character would weaken the PLO. The PLO was the Palestinian Liberation Organization of Yasser Arafat, which was the main um, representative group of Palestinians uh, at that time. The PLO was, uh, it says here, the most prominent official representative of Palestinian interests. Dreyfus also pointed out that during the 1980s, the Muslim Brotherhood in Gaza and the West Bank 
did not support resistance to the Israeli occupation. Most of its energy went to fighting the PLO, especially its more left-wing factions on university campuses. Charles Freeman, the one-time American ambassador to Saudi Arabia, said this, Israel started Hamas. It was a project of Shin Bet, that's Israel's internal um, intelligence agency, um, which had a feeling that they could use it to um, hem in the PLO. David Shipler, a reporter on the New York Times, quotes the Israeli military governor of Gaza as saying that Israel financed Islamic fundamentalists to oppose the PLO. And this is what uh, Shipler said. Politically speaking, Islamic um, fundamentalists were sometimes regarded as useful to Israel because they had conflicts with the secular supporters of the PLO. Violence between the two groups erupted occasionally on West Bank University campuses. Divide and rule, divide and rule. Israeli military uh, governor of the Gaza Strip, Brigadier General Yitzhak uh, Segev, once told me how he had financed the Islamic movement as a counterweight to the PLO and the communists. The Israeli government gave me a budget and the military government gives it to the mosques, he said. And Yasser Arafat, the um, head of the PLO, told um, an Italian newspaper, Hamas is a creation of Israel, which at the time of Prime Minister Shamir, brackets terrorist, um, gave them money and more than 700 institutions, among them schools, universities and mosques. Arafat said that the Israeli Prime Minister Yitzhak uh, Rabin had told him in the presence of Egypt's President Mubarak that Israel had supported Hamas. It goes like this, uh, it says this is in the book, um, every time there is any chance of a peace agreement which would commit Israel to an outcome that it doesn't want, Hamas or the Muslim Brotherhood carry out a terrorist attack, or Mossad does, the Israeli uh, intelligence arm, military intelligence arm. And this is used as the excuse to end negotiations. Uh, Israel orders its agents in Hamas to start firing the military equivalent of peace shooters at um, uh, Israel to justify the state-of-the-art bombing and mass murder of Palestinians in retaliation. Hamas representatives who won't play ball of it or with Israel are the ones that are targeted. Now, I mean, look at that line. Um, Israel orders its agents in Hamas to start firing the military equivalent of peace shooters at Israel to justify state-of-the-art bombing and mass murder. Palestinians and uh, in retaliation. This was written some years ago and we're seeing it repeated again now. It's so important that people do not see the world in black and white. It's not like that. It, you're meant to see it like that. That's, that, that's the way it's, um, it's presented. But that's not how it is. And just because um, people call themselves one thing doesn't mean they're not working for that which they say um, they oppose. And we, um, oh dear, I'm sweating today. It's a really hot day in here. Yeah. If you're around the world, it's been a really hot uh, week in England and um, it's, um, it's boring in it. Anyway, one of the things that um, has come out in the last uh, few days is that this, this idea of... Um, the suggested ceasefire, which was supposedly brokered by Egypt and agreed to by Israel, and that the, the claim is that Hamas wouldn't uh, play ball, and therefore the fact that, that um, Palestine civilians go on getting killed by Israeli um, weaponry is the fault of Hamas because they could have had a ceasefire. Well. When you look at the background to that, that's another inversion. And guess who was involved? Guess who was involved in brokering and bringing about that um, alleged ceasefire offer? Only Tony Blair, the Middle East envoy, um, supposedly neutral, but actually the Middle East envoy to Israel. And anything that Blair's involved in, anything that Netanyahu is involved in, and then we've got this di dictator, what's his name, Al Sisi, or whose bloody name is in, in, in Egypt, he's a military dictator. Anything any of them are bloody involved in is a scam. And what was happening is that people have been so sickened by the killing 
of Palestinian civilians and children in this um, manufactured attack on Gaza, the latest, that Israel were big time losing the, the, the public opinion, what they call the propaganda war, and they had to find a way around that. So they manipulated this alleged offer of a ceasefire, um, which almost certainly was not communicated to Hamas. Uh, and the whole thing was meant to fail, because now, and you, you'll hear these Israeli radio leaders going on now, now they're saying, oh, well, they, they could have stopped it, but, but we offered, but they, they kept firing their pop guns, and, and, and we've got to go back with state-of-the-art weaponry to defend ourselves. Uh, so it's all a game. And it's a game that has been going on all this time. And fundamental to it has been to maintain the lie of justification. Staggering as it seems when you've got a brain that's actually an active duty. That Israel, as a homeland for the Jews, is justified because God gave it to them, according to some texts, no one knows where it came from. And to maintain that lie, the truth about the real origins in Khazaria have to be um, suppressed. The world is indeed inverted wherever you look. But we are where we are. And although the founding of Israel has been based on a lie, all those Israelis are there now. And a, a lot of them are opposing the war uh, and the slaughter and the attacks on Gaza. A lot of them aren't, but a lot of them are. And so we are where we are. And the only way of solving this is for justice to be done. For Palestinians to be given a right to self-determination to be given the land back that has been stolen by Israel and, and is being um, built upon um, with these settlers more and more so that it, it becomes more and more uh, irreversible. But it doesn't. Get them off. Get them out. They knew that they were building on stolen land. It wasn't theirs. Um, and Israelis and Palestinians need to live in, decide to live in peace with equal rights and equal statehood. I am apparently a conspiracy theorist because there are no conspiracies, only theories of them. It's official. And I pointed out the nonsense of this reflex action dismissal that there are any conspiracies when, according to the official definition, we are drowning in them. Uh, the Oxford English Dictionary uh, defines a conspiracy as a secret plan by a group to do something unlawful or harmful. So, even though it's come out in great detail and there's about to be a, a, a massive um, report coming out soon upon it, Tony Blair and George Bush did not uh, secretly plan with the people that controlled them. Uh, to lie to the British American global public to justify the invasion of Iraq that otherwise would not have been justified. The whole uh, weapons of mass destruction lie, nonsense, fantasy. Another definition of conspiracy is the action of plotting or conspiring. So people don't plot and conspire to get the outcome that they are looking for. This doesn't happen. It's only a theory. Um, the definition of plotting, secretly making plans to carry out. So politicians, corporations, uh, banks, etc., they don't um, secretly uh, conspire plot, secretly make plans to 
get the outcome that they want. Well, there's endless examples of it that have come to public attention. At the moment, we've got the secret negotiations on trade agreements like TTIP and the Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, which involve dark suit bureaucrats and dark suit lobbyists negotiating a transformation of human society with corporations. But that is not secretly making plans to carry out. And then we come to conspiracy theory. This is the definition of that. A belief that some covert but influential organisation is responsible for an unexplained event. So that never happens then. There's never a time when a covert but influential organisation is responsible for an unexplained event. And by the way, the uh, term conspiracy theory and conspiracy theorist came into widespread use when the CIA used it and encouraged um, media organisations to use it. The documents exist to show that that's what they did to discredit those uh, people who were questioning the official story in the 1960s of the Kennedy assassination and that of Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Bobby Kennedy. You know, real nutters who couldn't couldn't grasp the credibility of the official story of the Kennedy assassination, which involved this magic bullet, single bullet theory, where a bullet went through several people and, and to do so um, had to change uh, direction at crazy angles. And also, people who couldn't work out um, how, uh, when Kennedy was clearly from the Zabruder film footage, uh, hit in the front of the head, that that could have been done by uh, Lee Harvey Oswald, who was way back behind him. Maybe they had some secret technology that made bullets do U-turns. Maybe that explains it. No more crazy than the magic bullet. So conspiracy theorist and conspiracy theory has been used all this time as a term to discredit people who are seeking to uncover what's really going on, as opposed to what we're told is going on. So anyway, I did this um, interview, it was only about seven minutes in the dead of night, um, with the presenter called Andrew Neal. And it started out with me being asked if I if I could say that I was a conspiracy theorist or I was dealing in conspiracies. Well, first of all, as I pointed out, there are conspiracy theories where someone is saying, well, especially immediately after an event, before the real research has started, well, it could be this, it could be that. That could be what's behind it. That's a theory. But what's missed is that the great, great majority of research into um, various aspects of the global conspiracy, because I don't see uh, conspiracies all over the place. I see basically one conspiracy with infinite number of uh, faces and expressions. The bulk of it is backed by hard research evidence and connecting the dots to see the picture. And I was asked uh, for some conspiracies. And I pointed out that this very week, or that very week, um, we'd had a blatant conspiracy um, uncovered by the uh, Daily Mail newspaper, which showed that the Prime Minister, David Cameron, uh, was conspiring with big business to frighten the British public into staying in the European Union in this upcoming referendum. And while he was um, conspiring, and it came out through 
uh, leaked emails. Uh, to, to do that, he was telling Parliament and he was telling the British people that if he did not get the negotiations or renegotiations that he wanted with the EU, then one option was to come out. It was never an option. It was a lie. And I was asked for another conspiracy and I pointed out another one that's in our face. The way that Bush, Blair and uh, the American and... Uh, British establishment lied about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq to justify an invasion which uh, cost the lives and caused the, uh, the suffering and the injury to millions of people, not just then, but ongoing with all that's come from it in the Middle East. And I pointed out that while that is now accepted, and accepted by the mainstream media, that those lies were told to justify an invasion that was otherwise unjustifiable. That they laugh and dismiss any idea that the official story of 9-11 is not true, when not just the same agencies, but the same people who told us the official story of uh, weapons of mass destruction in Iraq were the same people who gave us the official story of 9-11. How can you blatantly accept that that was a monumental lie, but, oh no, every facet of that, they were telling the truth? Hello? Well, at that point, it was, it was, going, it was going too well. So... Um, Andrew Neil threw the question in, as they always do. Do you still think um, the Queen uh, and the royal family are, are lizards? Which is, in a seven-minute interview, impossible to respond to. Uh, but I said, yes, I do. And pointed out that there is a massive backstory of information, ancient and modern, that people need to see before what appears on the surface to be crazy takes on uh, a, a logical or more logical um, state. And this brings me to why I would say I, I laugh at them, but I, I, I do shake my head. I do find it funny. Uh, when I see these people with supposed intellects and the intellect equals intelligence to them, when they're living in a mind prison that is so tiny, it's ridiculous. Something I call the program. Let's put this, um, oh, it, 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 this is, oh, yeah, ridiculous, ridiculous, ridiculous. Well, have, you, have you read any background? No, no. Will you ever? No. Well, how can you say it's ridiculous then? Well, well it is. Well, let, let's look at ridiculous. According to mainstream science, the electromagnetic spectrum is as low as 0.005% of what exists in this universe reality in terms of matter and energy. Some say it's a bit higher, as high as 0.05%. Uh, uh, but whichever it is, it's tiny. We can only see a fraction of that spectrum, that 0.005% of what exists, according to mainstream estimates. A little sliver of frequency they call visible light. Everything else outside of that is invisible to us. In other words, 
the virtual entirety of what exists is invisible to us. So here's a question to those people uh, who are dismissing things that sound strange to them just because they sound strange to them. What exists in that almost entirety of reality that we can't see? What exists? And what do they say? Well, well, I don't know. So how can you just dismiss without question, as um, Einstein said, condemnation without investigation is the height of ignorance, which kind of sums it all up, really. How can you dismiss without a thought when you're admitting you don't know what exists in that almost entirety of reality that we can't see? And of course, there's no answer for that. But there is an explanation and it's the program. And this is so important to understanding why the world is as it is and why people are as they are and why minds are closed as they are in so many people. The program is basically a download of a perception of normal. This is the key. Because once you've downloaded a perception of normal, anything outside the normal, whether it's true or not, is going to be dismissed because it's not normal. But what is normal? Normal is only what we normally experience. So if you live in a deserted area, your normal is never seeing people, never seeing a car, for instance. If you live in an urban area, your normal is always seeing people and always seeing cars. And if a car turns up in an uninhabited kind of area, people there would say, oh, that's not normal. And when the streets are empty in an urban area, it's like, oh, that's not normal. What's going on? So normal is only what we normally experience. And what we get is a download of normal from cradle to grave. When a baby comes into the world, they're immediately influenced by the parents version of normal because they've been through the process that they're about to go through. You're then into school ridiculously quickly and you're getting the, the state's download. You're being told when you have to be there, when you when you can leave, when you can eat, when you can talk and crucially what's right, what's wrong, what's possible, what imp is, is impossible, what is and what isn't. Now this goes on through... Um, all your formative years into higher education where you pay for your own programming and get into debt for years and years hence uh, as a result of it um, and all the time you are getting the download of the state's version of normal in terms of health in terms of politics in terms of um, science in terms of everything it's what I call the mainstream everything then people go off into the institutions of, um, of law, of politics, of medicine, of science, of journalism. And they take with them that core programming of normal. And it is a tiny, tiny pea-sized perception of possibility. You know, squeezing people's Perception of the possible is crucial to this overall control system. Because the more you squeeze the sense of possibility, when people come along outside of that and saying this is going on, that immediately rejects it because it's outside of its sense of the possible. But it doesn't mean it's not happening. It's just outside of the, the sense of perception that it could be happening. And these institutions then... Um, confirm each other that they're right because they're all repeating the same programming of the possible and of course people in, in general society are getting their information from the mainstream media which is actually taking its point of observing the world from the same sense of the possible then you've got peer pressure and family pressure around you to conform to this download of normal because they've um, 
downloaded it, accepted it, and thus arrogantly um, insist that everyone else accepts it. Otherwise you get ridiculed or dismissed or called dangerous or whatever, extremist. And so when I was sitting in that studio uh, a few days ago in London on the BBC programme, I was sitting there with Andrew Neil, who is a journalistic representative of the sense of the normal. And he's not alone. I'm not just talking about him. I mean, it's journalism in general. Across from me was a guy called Michael Portillo, former Margaret Thatcher Conservative Minister. And next to him was a lady called Liz Kendall, a Labour MP, who um, stood uh, for the Labour Opposition Party leadership uh, when Jeremy Corbyn uh, won. And what this normal does in that if you like, political and journalistic environment, indeed, more widely, it operates from what I call the postage stamp consensus. And that is an agreement between all parties, spoken and unspoken, taken for granted, of the definition of normal and what's possible. And anyone that even thinks outside of that normal, that postage stamp consensus, usually will censor what they say and what they do on the basis of knowing what the consequences are for their credibility and status for going outside of the postage stamp consensus because they'll get jumped upon by everyone else in it. Ooh, you've gone a bit strange. They'll be, they'll be like that David Icke bloke next. And so we have the, the postage stamp, the download of normal, not only constantly confirmed by all the mainstream information sources, including education, of course, we have it defended by self-censorship by those who are questioning it but don't say so. So someone like me comes along who doesn't give a damn what people think about me. I just want to know what's happening, whatever it is. Well, I tend to blow their bloody minds, really. But the interview went on and... Um, Liz Kendall, the Labour MP, was asked what she thought of conspiracies. And she came out with a classic, I've heard this so many times, um, that it's people who have a psychological need to explain the world, a world that is random and basically chaotic. So there were no lies then about weapons of mass destruction in Iraq. There was no conspiracy, even though it's been uh, brought out recently, over suppressing what really happened and what was really behind the deaths of Liverpool football supporters in the Hillsborough disaster. There is no conspiracy involving the European Union when as documents show when it started they wanted to create a certain kind of centralised super state dictatorship even though they were selling a free trade area and step by step by step they've moved to exactly what they set out to create and when uh, referendums uh, 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 of, of the public uh, opinion have gone against what they want in this continuing sequence, they've just ignored them. Or like in uh, Ireland, they have um, waited a bit, done a bit more manipulation, and then um, had another referendum to get the result they want. There is no conspiracy, even though the facts can be laid out 
in great detail. Ted Heath, who signed us into the European Union, agreed to run down the manufacturing industry, to run down uh, the fishing industry, uh, to run down mining as part of entry. And all those things have happened since, um, exactly as he agreed. But there's no conspiracy. See, this is the thing. It's not just the Liz Kendalls of this world. Um, it's the postage stamp consensus in general. Um, it just takes on a sense of normal. And in this case, normal is there are no conspiracies because it's all theories. Well, the CIA said. And what they don't do because of that instant reaction is actually look at the facts. Is every um, suggestion of a conspiracy true? No. Of course not. There are some that remain theoretical. But there's vast numbers that are supportable by compelling and telling evidence and facts. But they never look at that. No, consp it was a conspiracy theorist. And in that response, they're being played like a violin by the system that is using conspiracy theorists, and indeed the word conspiracy, as a form of um, ridicule and contempt. And what they are is coincidence theorists. They are people that despite all this interconnected evidence, despite the same people and organisations coming up all the time in relation to different things to push on the same agenda, it's all a coincidence. Talk about fully paid up members of Naivety Anonymous. And then we came to Michael Portillo, this former Margaret Thatcher uh, minister. And his opinion on conspiracies was that um, they were intellectually lazy. And that was an extraordinary statement, um, both in its ludicrousness and also in the fact that the opposite is true. What is more intellectually lazy than just to take the official version of everything and believe it. I mean, you can't, you can't define intellectual laziness more clearly. But no, it's the people who spend their lives checking facts and making connections to show that actually the official story is not what's going on. They are intellectually lazy. This is um, one of my books, my biggest book, and it's, uh, it was very intellectually lazy to write that and research that. But this is how it works. And, you know, Michael Portillo, by the way, also, also indicated in this interview that um, the claims of a Westminster paedophile ring were, were shown to be not true. Well, that is not true. What's happened is that people and the, uh, people in the media and politics have worked very hard to give the impression that it's been trashed, but it hasn't. Is every claim 100% true? Of course not. It'd be the first time. But when you put the totality of the evidence together, including all these inquiries going on, into claims by former policemen that when they were investigating paedophilia and paedophile rings and they got close to big names, they were the, the whole thing was shut down. Yeah, you do that when it's not happening, don't you? So, it's this program, this sense of normal that is at the heart of human servitude. You know, again, mainstream science. The brain is receiving, it is said, about 11 million 
sensations or snapshots of reality every second. But the brain takes just 40 of those 11 million a second to construct our reality. We're told that this world, and we experience this world, as being solid. But it's not. Quantum physics has shown that it has no solidity if you go deep enough into it. So we are living a, a fantastic, extraordinary illusion, even in our daily experience, in terms of its physicality. And we're doing it within this tiny band of frequency called visible light. We're almost bloody blind to everything that exists. And yet, the download of normal, what people call the intellect, as opposed to the consciousness beyond it, and the intellect is the village idiot compared with uh, consciousness and awareness beyond the intellect. But because of the normal download, the intellect is worshipped Oh, he's got a great mind. He's got a great intellect. Oh, really? I am sorry. Um, and so we are making these reflex action dismissals and condemnations and issuing the ridicule to respond to people who are seeking to go deeper into this unseen and find out what's there and how it's influencing what we're experiencing here. If you do that, you're mad. And there was a there was a comment um, on um, one of the stories about the interview. Because, of course, all the, me the media went all on. He says, the Queen's listen. Oh, okay. The fact that um, you agree there were lies about Iraq, but the same people told you the story of 9-11, and you believe that in every facet, that that's not worth a mention? What? Or, or a focus upon? No. It's listed. But one comment said, you know, basically that what I said made sense, but the reptilian thing let me down. No, it didn't. See, this is the this is another aspect of this post Islam consensus that if you go outside of it, then you must therefore lose your credibility. With what? With those still in it. But that's on the basis of I care about credibility. I don't. I care about what's going on. I care about what's happening. I care about what people are going to experience if this uh, whole um, global agenda for the global Orwellian state is not headed off. And so my focus is not credibility. Oh, that David Icke's so clever. Oh, thank you very much. That's very kind. It's what the hell's going on. And if what's going on, and it is, is outside the postage stamp, is outside the download of normal, then I'm going to talk about it. So from my perspective, it's not talking about non-human influence on human life that is letting me down. Quite the opposite. What would be letting me down is if I allowed the intimidation of the postage stamp mentality to stop me saying what I believe to be true and writing what I believe to be true. It's a different way of looking at everything. And of course, mainstream everything is not doing that, thus they find me strange, and I'm very confident in that. They found me normal. Um, I'll have to reevaluate. And so... I had a chuckle afterwards. I, I actually, to be honest, I was having a chuckle during it inside. At the naivety that was all around me, the program sense of everything that was all around me. What I'm trying to say, actually, there is more to the world than you think, and there's more to the world 
than I think. As Socrates and people like Confucius have said, wisdom is knowing how little we know, so your mind's constantly open to all possibility. It doesn't mean you accept everything, but it's open to the possibility if it can be stood up. But wisdom is knowing how little we know. That's not how the postage stamp works. That's not how the normal program works. And at the end of it all, the problem is not that I see conspiracies everywhere. It's that those people don't see them anywhere. And that is how they get away with it. Outrageous things have been going on and, uh, and been said in relation to, um, to older people for expressing their right to an opinion. But there's another schism unfolding, which is just as important. And that is between young people with a mind of their own and a great swathe of young people, those that are complaining now, who have given their minds away to such an extent that they have become little more than computer terminals on the state's internet. It's been my enormous pleasure over the years to see uh, how many young people, despite going through this massive programming operation called um, education, whether it's school or whether it's college, university, all together, and the and the uh, the media um, confirmation that the perception programming that they've had from uh, education, the state's version of everything, is is true, and people should believe it, and all the institutions um, doing the same. It's extraordinary um, how many young people have still not succumbed to the program and are able to look at um, the world and events from their own perspective and actually have the self-respect to do their own research rather than just taking it from the state as read. So, you know, they, they are amazing people because, you know, I've been saying for a, a long time that, you know, I feel for young generations today because of the scale of perception programming that they are put through from the moment now they, they enter the world virtually. And I understand why people have bought the perception download and stand on the same postage stamp consensus with everybody else. But it's very, very uh, dangerous to um, what's left of freedom. And if people want to buy the program, that's up to them. But the way they impose their own programming on everyone else by insisting that you can't say this, you can't do that, because it doesn't suit their perception program, well, that is quite something else and needs to be urgently, urgently challenged. Because while we have this um, emerging, uh, emerging and gathering number of young people who are taking their minds back or not giving them away in the first place, we also have the, the polarity of that which is the politically correct, um, deeply uninformed, um, deeply uh, programmed, and um, what I refer to as Generation Jelly, where they can't be upset by anything, including an opinion they don't agree with. And this um, Generation Jelly is being systematically moulded 
to become the generation's jelly in adult life, which the state will be able to control without any challenge whatsoever. I mean, we've got a situation here now where we've just left uh, an extraordinarily extreme, and it's nowhere near where it's meant to be and meant to go, an extreme um, centralised dictatorship called the European Union, or at least we've voted to leave, they're going to do what they can to stop that, clearly, as I said, within two hours of the vote. Um, but we've uh, at least voted to leave this dictatorship, and yet the young generations of Generation Jelly, not the, the ones with a mind of their own, um, are complaining that they've been got out of jail and their children and grandchildren got out of jail by the older generation. An older generation that um, has the experience of what life was like before we joined the EU. Anyone uh, younger than their kind of early 40s will not have known um, a country before the EU. They only know what they've been brought up with, so it's their normal. And Britain before the EU was not perfect. But, my goodness me, at least decisions affecting this country were being made in this country by people, at least officially, that you could see, instead of um, bureaucrats that people can't even name. We had the extraordinary sight of this um, Labour Party politician, Harriet Harman, on a television interview, pushing to stay in the EU, who was shown the presidents of the EU, including the main one, Juncker, who um, is, is in the news all the time. And she was asked to name them. And she couldn't. She didn't know anything about them. And this is what uh, has happened with so many young people. They have bought the party line of um, the political establishment and the moneyed and political classes and just repeated it and accepted it without question, without any background research of their own into the nature of the EU and why so many people uh, wanted to come out. So, we have this, um, this generation jelly that um, thinks it's progressive. That means your know, heart on the sleeve and all that stuff, but isn't quite the opposite. That thinks it's um, anti-racist when all, all it can see is race, uh, uh, race everywhere. And it says it believes in democracy. Well, clearly it doesn't because it wants a second referendum when we've just had one that's uh, voted one way, but they don't like it. Democracy to Generation Jelly is only um, when, when the result suits them. They say they believe in um, fairness and justice and diversity, when actually they're destroying all of those things. What's diverse about shutting down opinions um, that uh, you don't agree with? We've, we've now got this, um, this generation emerging that wants safe spaces where no one says anything that can upset them. How can you possibly move on in your understanding of anything unless your beliefs are challenged? Or, or not even challenged that someone else can say something different. And, and, and these progressives that believe in freedom and justice and democracy have this now incredibly Orwellian term of deplatforming people, which means banning them from speaking and having their right to free speech if they're going to say something that might upset the, um, the jelly spine that somehow they walk around with. And 
when I grew up in the 50s and the 60s, particularly the 60s, before the EU, of course, um, the, the student populations used to march for freedom of speech. Now they march and campaign against it. I mean, hello? And what they've allowed themselves to do is to download this um, off-the-peg postage stamp um, perception of everything. And of course, the uh, school system, the uh, college and university system, academia in general, um, not least because many of them and many institutions are on the EU payroll, um, are all pro-EU, all pushing the EU. And that's what they, they, you know, these people have grown up with. But instead of saying, well, hold on, I'm going to do my own research here. I'm going to see if that stands up. They just accept it. And um, so we have this um, extraordinary attack, not by young people with minds of their own, but by Generation Jelly against older people. And um, this is a story this week. I mean, I mean, it is extraordinary. This is um, the headline. Media pushes ban on old people voting after Brexit. Older people were far more likely to vote to leave the European Union. And having lost the argument, supporters of Remain are blaming them, insult them and even arguing their democratic rights should now be curtailed. The demographic um, divide in last week's vote was stark, it says. The more working class, poor, old and uneducated people are, statistically, the more likely they were to support Brexit. The more wealthy, metropolitan, young, urban and educated, the higher is the chance they backed the EU bureaucracy. One big mistake there. Um, educated. They're not educated. That's the problem. They're programmed. Because that's what the education system is. It's a programming system to get people for life to see everything in the way the state wants them to see it. And of course the state uh, wants them to see the European Union as some benevolent wonderful organization when it is a centralized uh, bureaucratic uh, merciless dictatorship um, so educated the more educated you are no the more programmed you are the more likely you are to um, unquestioningly follow the state um, line and you know working class poor old uneducated doesn't mean freaking stupid but this arrogant uh, generation jelly uh, believes that. Oh, they haven't been to university, they're stupid. Well, you've been to university and look at you. Bloody hell. And uh, working class and, and, um, and, and uh, uh, poor and educated, it doesn't mean they're stupid. It means actually that they can work thing out, things out for themselves. And... It also means that they've not been uh, um, through that long uh, period of their formative years downloading the state's version of everything. So maybe they have a modicum of a mind of their own still. Unlike Generation Jelly. Story goes on. Of course, barely concealed contempt for the working classes, particularly the white poor, is nothing new to social media or the liberal press. But the all out attacks on senior citizens post referendum has shocked many um, headlines in the Europhile press have included how old people have screwed over the younger generation from the independent, which isn't. And uh, EU referendum results young screwed by older generations from the Huffington Post. Yes, um, the Leave voters have um, voted against all um, laws and regulations and rules that have any significance whatsoever 
being made, it's like 50, 60% now, but they want the lot. That's what the whole EU agenda is about. Um, that all those decisions and impositions will be made by dark suit bureaucrats that people can't name. And most of them never see. Whoa, what a terrible thing to do to young people. And then we've got um, vice gavers, the article says. Old people seem intent on fucking over uh, or fucking us over uh, forever. And Brexit proves baby boomers should get less of a vote. The progressives speak. We, we are educated. We are highly intelligent. If someone says something different to us, they must therefore, by definition, be wrong and stupid. Mirror anybody? Um, like I say, democracy is only any good to them if it suits what they want to do. GQ magazine uh, went all out, the article says, producing we should ban old people from voting. Writing about them, as if the older generations are some foreign species, the reasons given by the author included, the EU referendum result will have less effect on older people over 65s read the Daily Mail. What, all of them? What? Um, there was no golden age of Britain. No, there wasn't. But there was an age when we made our own decisions. And dark suit bureaucrats didn't. We take pensioners' driving licences away. Why not their right to vote? <laughs> Progressives. God dear. Imagine if they were fascist. Um, extraordinarily uh, uh, chilling, that is. Um, it's Orwellian and uh, then some, and it's the way uh, Generation Jelly is, is being led down to this global Orwellian state that I've been exposing for so long. Um, the article says it's hard to tell where the satire ends and explicit generational loathing begins. Another quote from this article. Aside from a pathological preoccupation with immigration, the most pervasive reason for the Grey Army voting leave is an inarticulate longing to return to the hazy memories of an idealised Britain that never was, GQ informs us. Uh, you mean returning to making our own decisions within the land those decisions affect? Eh? Dear. And... Um, it says here, in line with others, political blogger Kevin Drum, for it is he, uh, attempted to dismiss the free will and rational decision making of the elderly, writing, at its core, this is the last stand of old people, it ain't mate, uh, who have been frightened to death by cynical right wing media empires and the demigod uh, uh, demagogues who enable them. Well, if ever the truth was inverted, it's in that sentence. And I don't know where you uh, uh, live, Mr. Drum, but wherever it is, it will be somewhere in the land of the bewildered. Um, the cynical right-wing media empires and demagogues. One of the things that is extraordinary about uh, the young people and the progressives who voted to stay in the EU, is that, I don't know whether they noticed, but they lined up um, with the entire political establishment and the political classes um, right across this so-called political spectrum from Labour across to Conservative. They um, lined up with the, um, the global financial uh, cabal, including Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, Citigroup, the City of London, uh, and they lined up, uh, the IMF, another one, and they lined up also with people like Tony Blair. Anybody remember what he did in Iraq? Anybody remember what he did 
um, to so many people in terms of death, destruction, maiming, vast numbers of people. Oh, Tone wants to stay in the EU. Of course he does. Because he's part of the same web of those others that I've just uh, mentioned. And progressive young people line up with that lot. You having a laugh? But they don't see it. They don't see it. Um, here's another guy that they lined up with. CFR member, that's the Council on Foreign Relations in, a member, uh, in America, that basically drives um, US foreign policy with, with other groups, including all that's gone in, on in the Middle East, by the way. CFR member calls on elites to rise up against ignorant masses. You still think you're on the right side, eh? With these people that want to stay in the EU. Um, this guy is the wealthy heir to the Bloomingdale um, luxury department store uh, chain. And he sneers, the article says, at populist voters who cherish, quote, values and tradition. Ooh, condemn them. Stop them voting. In a column for Foreign Policy magazine, Council on Foreign Relations member James Traub argues that the elite need to rise up against the mindlessly angry, ignorant masses in order to prevent globalization, the centralization of global power in fewer and fewer hands, um, from being derailed by the populist revolt le uh, that led to Brexit. And you know, a lot of these, um, these people uh, who um, are, are condemning uh, the older generations for bringing us out of the EU, um, they will actually go on marches, some of them, against um, globalisation and what it's doing. What they don't realise is the EU is fundamentally part of that whole globalisation exercise. It's the centralisation of power. And at every point you centralise power, fewer and fewer people have control to dictate the lives of more and more. I would say, you know, you know, be educated, get educated, but 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 you you know this 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 generation jelly perceives education as, as going through universities and and schools and stuff. Education, real education, is education yourself, not being told what to think. Uh, this guy Traub, he's concerned that quote today's citizen revolt in the United States, Britain, and Europe may upend politics as nothing else has in my lifetime. Good. Traub notes that Brexit was an utter repudiation of bankers and economists, except by Generation Jelly, uh, that complains about bankers, and an example of how extremism has gone mainstream. That's another Orwellian inversion. Wanting uh, freedom to make decisions within your own, uh, within the borders of the area affected by those decisions is extremism. Giving uh, that power to bureaucrats you can't name, uh, that is um, the opposite of extremism. That is being reasonable. That is being moderate. That's being progressive. Um, and it says here, um, another quote from this bloke, um, with prospects of flat growth in Europe and minimal income growth in the United States, voters are rebelling against their dismal long term uh, prospects. And globalization means culture as well as economics. Older people whose familiar world is vanishing beneath a welter of foreign tongues and multicultural celebrations uh, are waving their fists at cosmopolitan elites. This is another area. Um, what the progressives and Generation Jelly have is this designer compassion, this designer empathy which is only reserved for people that um, they agree with or that fit into their perception of the world. What about the compassion of people seeing the, 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 the city or the place that they grew up in transforming dramatically in speed and nature? 
Does anyone have any compassion for how they must feel? And understand why they must feel? As they do? No. No. Because um, what they think, feel and experience is irrelevant to this law. And that is another reason why so many uh, voted to come out of the EU. Because the referendum gave them the chance to express their voice that they've never had the chance to before. No political party um, represents them. And whenever they say, look, you know, the, the, the neighbourhood or the, or the city that I knew, it's, it's, it's completely uh, changed. I, I don't recognise it. I feel, you know, um, that I'm not in the land that I grew up in. Um, then you're called racist. And the same would be true if, like the bloody British Empire, you went into other countries and changed them in the same way. It's no, it's no good just dismissing these people as racists. We have to look at how they feel and, and, and what they've experienced. And 